Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's AX1 press conference. I'm Bettina Klan with Axiom Space. We're excited to share an update on Axiom Space's AX1 mission, the Hello, first all private thank you mission to the International Space Station AX1 press conference. I'm Bettina Klan with Axiom Space. We're excited Over the next to share few an update minutes on Axiom Space's AX1 over the next few minutes, we'll be um, we'll have brief remarks from the Axiom leadership, the AX1 astronauts, who are currently in quarantine in Florida, who in just five days will launch to the International Space Station, our orbiting laboratory. Um, as a reminder, today's speakers include Michael Suffordini, the president and CEO of Axiom Space, Peggy Whitson, the director of human spaceflight at Axiom Space, Michael Lopez Alegria, commander of AX1. Larry Connor, pilot of AX1, Eitan Stibbe, mission specialist AX1, and Mark Pathy, mission specialist of AX1. In a moment, I'll turn it over to our speakers to provide some opening remarks, but just as a reminder um, that we've had some questions that have been submitted ahead of time. If you'd like to submit a question, please submit it in the chat box. Um, please state your name, um, news affiliation, and who would you like to direct the question to, and we'll get to as many questions as possible. But now I'd like to start and turn it over um, to Michael Suffordini, the president and CEO of Axiom Space. Thank you, Bettina, and good afternoon. It's uh, it's great to be here. As Bettina said, five days away from uh, launch of what is a truly historic mission uh, to the International Space Station. It's the first fully commercial uh, flight to the International Space Station with our wonderful crew uh, that you'll get a moment to chat with. You know, Axiom Space uh, was uh, was really formed uh, to make space more accessible to everyone. Uh, and this is really does represent the first step where uh, a bunch of individuals who want to do something meaningful in low Earth orbit uh, that aren't members of a government are able to, uh, to take this opportunity. And as you'll hear as we go forward, they're doing uh, quite a few very uh, meaningful things that will help us all benefit humanity uh, as a whole. And we look forward to the mission, but perhaps more importantly, it is the first, it's really a precursor mission to uh, the, a space station, a fully commercial space station that uh, we are developing. Uh, the first module of which will launch in uh, late 2024. Uh, and so this is the first of a series of precursor missions before uh, our space station is launched and assembled on orbit, ultimately uh, replacing the International Space Station when it is, uh, when it is retired. Uh, so with that, uh, I hope you enjoy your opportunity here. We'll look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. We'll turn it over now to Peggy. It's really exciting to be here as part of this uh, preparation for this mission. Uh, the crew is very well trained. They've spent many hundreds of hours prepping for this flight. It's a very complex flight, which uh, is you know, near and dear to my little geeky heart. I love the fact that we're getting so much scientific research done on this mission. And I know that not only are we gonna learn from the science that's being done, and that includes everything from things like genetic uh, identification of contaminants and um, aging and heart health, and uh, even technology demonstrations like, uh, the do uh, tell uh, oh, yeah. forget forget the March teleportation thing where they're doing a two way teleportation and the Tessa Air uh, experiment where they have self uh, assembling uh, tiles. I think all of this is going to be really very exciting. But if this precursor mission is important because not only are we developing the the techniques that we're going to be using communicating with the ground to space uh, here in mission control at Axiom, but we're also developing all the procedures and processes that make a space flight possible. So we are very excited about the mission, looking forward to it. And I know you guys are going to be interested in following along. Thank you so much, Peggy. Now we'll turn it over to our crew. The, we'll start with our commander, Michael Lopez Alegria. Thanks, Bettina. And I think I'd like to start by underscoring something that both Suf and Peg alluded to, and that this is a this is a 
uh, opening a new era in human spaceflight. We are taking the first step in a next generation platform initiative that's going to bring working, living, and research in space to a much broader um, and more international audience. I think um, any time you get to go to space is an amazing opportunity and it's ever sweeter for me looking, having looking back on my career um, as a NASA astronaut and having savored those experiences over the years. And for somebody who, when I left NASA 10 years ago, I became a uh, very strong advocate for and believer in commercial spaceflight in general and commercial human spaceflight in particular, this is borderlines on, on storybook for me. It's been a, a real privilege to work and train alongside these three remarkable gentlemen. Uh, we have spent countless hours in simulations, in technical training, in hands-on training, and they have brought unbelievable commitment, discipline, and an eagerness to, eagerness to learn to the endeavor. And I can say with zero hesitation that we are ready to fly. Uh, the teams, starting with NASA, SpaceX, Operator Solutions, all of the educational and uh, research institutions around the world have performed near miracles to get us to where we are today. And it's been especially gratifying to see the Axiom team, whose numbers you could count on one hand when I started, grow and gel and pull this mission together. So when I was a kid and uh, I was so inspired by the early manned missions uh, that NASA had put in the first three uh, Mercury, Gemini and Apollo missions, it was such an inspiration to me and to be able to participate in what I think is opening the next chapter is truly an honor. Back to you, Bettina. Thank you so much. Um, next we'll hear from Larry Conner, our pilot. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Three thoughts. First, expectations. When we started our training over a year ago, Axiom did, in my view, a great job outlining high expectations and standards for this first mission. I believe we will meet those standards. Second, I think it's important to address the difference between space tourists and private astronauts. Our feeling is with the space tourists, they'll spend 10 or 15 hours training, five to 10 minutes in space. And by the way, that's fine. In our case, depending upon our role, we spend anywhere from 750 to over a thousand hours training. Additionally, across all of the astronauts here, we're gonna do some 25 different experiments encompassing over a hundred hours of research on the eight days we're on the ISS. Lastly, I think I speak for all of us that we understand this first civilian mission is a big honor and a big opportunity. But with that comes a big responsibility. That is to execute the mission correctly and successfully. Thank you so much, Larry. Next, we'll turn it over to Eitan Stebe. Thank you, Bettina. To be a part of this unique crew is a proof for me that there is no dream beyond reach. And that is the motto of my mission in space, the work plan I have uh, for me in space, which is called Rakia. Rakia was assembled by its participants and uh, all of them contributed a portion of the workload that I will do there, including the Ramon Foundation, the Ministry of uh, technology and science, the Israeli Space Agency, hospitals, scholars, artists, children, they all took part in assembling this uh, very in interesting uh, work plan. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, 
Mark Pathy, our mission specialist. Thanks, Bettina. Um, I'll start by just uh, saying that sitting here with my crewmates who I've become really close with over the past uh, a year or so of preparation, uh, this close to launch, it's uh, really exciting. It's been uh, a really, at times, very intense year, uh, but incredibly stimulating, and uh, and uh, the best is yet to come. Uh, I'd say people often note that, and people who've been to space often note that going to space is something that uh, can be life-changing. And um, I have to say, for me, this past year, uh, it has already been life changing for me, and uh, we haven't even launched yet. So, uh, really excited about what uh, what's still to come. Uh, I'm especially pumped about uh, about the uh, my on orbit activities uh, and research. Um, that uh, you know, I've got a full slate uh, of, uh, of activities in areas that are that I'm particularly passionate about: uh, health sciences, innovation and technology, education, the environment. Um, and I'm really hoping that I and, and my colleagues who are all involved in, in similar types of uh, activities uh, are able to uh, help make meaningful advances in those areas, um, as well, of course, as having a, a really profound personal experience. So uh, just want to say thanks to the various organizations and, of course, many individuals who uh, helped get us here. We're, uh, we're primed for success and ready to go. Light it up. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for those wonderful remarks. Um, now we'll be taking questions from reporters. As a reminder, we have a bunch of questions that were submitted um, ahead and we'll get through those. And if you want to submit a question, please in the chat, submit your question. Please put your name, affiliation, and who you would like the question um, to be directed to. We will start today with AP's Marsha Dunn. Um, her question is for Eitan. How do you plan to build uh, on the Ilan Ramon's legacy in space? And are you taking anything up with you that belonged to him? And if I might ask, were you in Israel on February 1st, 2003, watching his return from space when he died aboard Shuttle Columbia? If you could recall that tragic day, please, thank you. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you for that question, it's very emotional. He was a good friend. He was my commander in uh, the squadron. And I, was, uh, I had the opportunity to visit him during his training at JSC in Houston, exactly the same place where we trained. And I will be continuing an experiment that he started 19 years ago, uh, mainly focused on observation of thunderstorms. And on that tragic day of the accident, I was at the squadron, watched with all of the Israeli people, and uh, it was a very painful day. Since then, we stayed in a very close relationship with Rona, his wife, with the children, and uh, till today. And I will take with me a few items, a, a copy of the diary that uh, survived somehow of that crash, a diary that Elon wrote on board the Columbia during a space flight. And some of the pages survived the crash. I will take copies of these pages with me and I will take a song written by his son and a beautiful painting uh, painted by his daughter, Noah, of pages falling out of the sky. Thank you, Eitan. Next, we're gonna hear from Lauren Grush. Can you explain the protocols for what um, areas of the International Space Station the astronauts can access, and are there any restricted restrictions on areas they can't interact with? And how is NASA calculating the travel cost for the use of those services? So, uh, Mike Safardini, you want to take that question? Uh, certainly. Uh, let's see. The first is uh, the crew actually does have access to the entire International uh, Space Station, um, it, and this is not uncommon. Uh, with other uh, private uh, space uh, tourists who have flown in the past. Um, however, they primarily will operate in the US segment uh, and, uh, and by invitation, uh, the, the Russian segment they'll be able to visit. Uh, as far as the, the types of compensation, we, uh, you know, this is what's unique about this mission is it's uh, completely uh, funded commercially. And so uh, we have to, uh, 
uh, compensate NASA for the use of the ISS and, uh, and other services, and we have done that. There are some things we are doing on this flight that uh, helps NASA out, uh, which we get credit for, and there's certain things uh, that we, of course, require from them uh, that we give them credit for. Uh, in the end, we, uh, we balance that all out. Thank you. Next question uh, will be Ken Brown, Fox News, Cincinnati for Larry. I'll be watching the press conference from your website and hoped to have Larry answer the following question. Outside, sorry, outside of being the first private astronaut from Southwest Ohio, what do you hope to accomplish with this flight and what do you want Ohioans to take away from your trip? Yeah, good question. So uh, I spoke earlier about the research, 25 different experiments, 100 hours. Also, we're doing educational out outreaches, all of us are, to multiple organizations. And the hope there is, is that future generations, we can, in our own small way, uh, inspire them to consider space, consider careers in space. As far as from Ohio, I'm very proud to be from Ohio. Obviously, there's been a number of uh, astronauts from there. By the way, I absolutely do not put myself in their lead. Iconic people like John Glenn, Neil Armstrong. And so I hope in some small measure to represent Ohio. And I am actually going to be taking uh, from Neil Armstrong's museum three different items, as well as I live in Dayton, Ohio the birthplace of Orville and Wilbur Wright. So I'll actually be taking a piece of cloth from the Wright's 1903 Kitty Hawk Flyer. Fantastic, that's great. Well, next question is gonna be from Jeff Faust of Space News for Michael Sofredini. As the first fully commercial uh, mission to the ISS, what is the business case for the AX-1 mission? Will this be profitable for Axiom or investment for the future? Uh, well, Jeff, that's an excellent question. Uh, of course, we're a, a commercial entity. Our objective is to make money uh, over the, uh, the uh, life of the company or we're not much of a company. Uh, we don't get in too much specifics about the, these flights and, uh, and the amount of profit uh, that we make, but suffice it to say, this is within line with what our original vision of for the mission was. And, uh, you know, ultimately these will grow to a point uh, where uh, when we're flying to our own space station, we'll have uh, quite a bit more access. We'll, we'll evolve these flights to do more and more commercial work. Oh, I'm sorry, commercial research work. Um, leading on then to uh, manufacturing in space. And we're already, uh, Peggy mentioned a couple of things going on this flight, which are precursors to, to actual manufacturing on space. And so each of these steps uh, represent uh, revenue for the company. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to tell you that, uh, that as a company will be very, uh, will be very healthy, especially in the out years. Thank you so much. Yeah. We're um, going through the questions. And again, if you want to submit a question, you can put through the chat um, and we will get to you as much fast as we can. Next question is for Mark from Don Halleduck from CBC. He wants to ask the following question. What was the spark for each of you that made what you uh, made you want to go to space? Um, you know, I, I always wanted to go to space as, as a child, I guess I grew up watching Star Trek. I saw at some point, uh, unlike these guys, I probably, I wasn't able to watch it live, but I did eventually see <laughs> man, man land on the moon for the first time, uh, which was inspiring. Um, but it was always an unachievable fantasy. Um, and I didn't think it would actually ever happen. So the actual spark, um, that made me think about actually going was, um, a conversation with a friend of mine three years ago uh, when he alerted me to the existence of this mission and, uh, and challenged me, not directly, but uh, that, that conversation challenged me to, to actually make that dream a reality finally. I uh, couldn't believe that it was actually possible. So uh, that was a spark. And uh, here we are three years later, getting ready to launch. Thank you, Mark. 
Our next question is from Irene Klotz for Michael Sofredini. If SLS wet dress is delayed by weather or technical issue, would that similarly impact AX1 launch? And for, Pe um, and <laughs> for Peggy or Suf, um, how many private astronaut missions do you anticipate flying with Axiom Astros before flying for um, paying customers? Okay, you'll have to ask the second question uh, again, but I'll answer the first one first. So uh, there is, the range is quite busy uh, before our launch. Uh, we had uh, the uh, SpaceX transporter flight, which is on the range today and potentially tomorrow if they scrub, but as you know, they launched uh, successfully and, uh, and landed their booster back. Uh, so uh, that's behind us. So next is uh, SLS. SLS is wet, wet dress. Our understanding is um, they they have the they're they're ready to go for the third to do their effort and we're on we're on the range for the fourth to do the hot fire before our launch on the sixth. So if uh, this is always a discussion, so I'm not going to give you a black and white answer, but I will tell you that if for some reason wet dress doesn't happen, uh, we'll work together. Uh, SpaceX, NASA, and Axiom will work together. Uh, to figure out where they would like to put uh, the wet dress for SLS given our launch opportunities. Today we have uh, four uh, opportunities, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth are all opportunities, although uh, the sixth has a relatively a long phasing. Uh, uh, and so even though it's a, it's a good launch date, it's a, a little bit long of a trip. But, you know, there's the idea is to go ahead and get this flight flown. Uh, we have a uh, commercial crew right behind us. I'm sorry, commercial crew four for ISS is right behind us. Uh, and so we're working closely with the ISS program to, to get our flight off before uh, we have to stand down for, for crew four. And they'll work with us on that too. So that's a long-winded way of saying that uh, right now they're scheduled on the third. We, have the, we actually have the range for the fourth for our hot fire and the range for the six for the for the launch and we would work together to figure out where the backup would be for sls should that be required for wet dress and then i'm sorry bettina i completely misunderstood it's fine. what the question was um i read out uh, squeezed in two questions in there and i read them both um it is how many private astronaut missions do you anticipate flying with axiom astros before flying flying for paying passengers Oh, I understand your question. Uh, the third flight likely. Thank you. Our next question is gonna be directed to the crew. I'm sorry, Bettina, I misspoke. The fourth flight, likely. Oh, fourth flight, okay, thank you. Flight. Our next question is gonna to go to the crew. It's from Chris Gemenhart from NASA Space Flight. It says, I know you talk in general about your experiments, but if you could each say what um, the experience you're most looking forward to and why. We'll start with um, Aton. Tell me which of the experiments that you're going to be doing in space that you're most looking forward to. The are experiments that uh, I'm quite passive in, like taking a, a laboratory, installing it on the ISS, and then packing it back to bring back home for results. The experiments that I'm more uh, prepared for are those where I'm uh, more involved, that I have to work inside the glove box or that I have deployed some equipment or produced things in space. One of the biggest obstacles of uh, space development is the price, the cost of bringing things uh, up to space. So the idea of industrial production in space is exciting. Wonderful. I'll go next, Patina. You know, the one that, um, and I'm not working nearly as many experiments as these guys are, but the one that I'm looking forward to is, uh, Peggy referred to, it's called Tesserae. It's a, a series of small pieces. Some are hexagons and some are pentagons and they're magnetized on the edges. And the idea is that you let them go and they will actually rendezvous and form ultimately a sphere. We're just taking part of that sphere on this mission, but it's obviously a technology demonstrator for future kinds of construction in space. So I have the good fortune to be working with both Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic, two experiments each, and they center around heart, aging, brain, and spine. So I'm really excited about that core group of experiments. 
Mark? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to all of them, but if I had to, to pick a couple, I mean, there, you can't beat, I guess, the sort of cool factor of a, of a uh, tech demo that Peggy sort of referred to, uh, <laughs> which is a uh, hollow portation, Peggy, two-way hollow portation, um, which would be the first time that that, uh, if, if successful, would be the first time that's done uh, between uh, Earth and, and the space station. Um, and uh, another technology demonstration with uh, a technology called MedChecker, um, checking and being able to identify medications uh, without any packaging and, and avoiding, uh, avoiding therefore, mistakes in, in medicating people and, and all that, which has applications in space and, and here on Earth. Uh, and, a, and in a lot of other new areas, I think there's some exciting new hypotheses in the area of, uh, of SANS and eye conditioned based by astronauts, uh, which is a uh, space associated neurosens neurosensory syndrome, uh, which I think is going to be uh, really interesting. And, and then a lot of other uh, stuff around uh, the effects of pain and inflammation, uh, tissue degeneration, which I think uh, will, will help to guide us in, uh, in prolonging uh, future missions in, in to deeper space, as well as uh, having better benefits for patients here at home. Great. Looking forward to all that great work you'll be doing in space, guys. Our next question comes from the Israeli um, public broadcasting, Nathan Gutman. This is for Eitan. And um, they would love if you could respond in Hebrew for their viewers and listeners back home in Israel. This is your last opportunity to speak to the Israeli public before the launch. Can you please share with the millions of Israelis who will be following the mission from Earth your thoughts before you go off to space, the type of last minute preparations you've been undertaking, and any message you might have about the importance of this mission for Israel and Israelis. <laughs> מוכיח עבורי שאין חלום רחוק מדי, כי את כל תוכנית העבודה הרכיבו המשתתפים בפרויקט, כל אחד, אם זה מדען, אם זה ילד או אה, סוכנות החלל, הציעו הצעות, קיבלנו מאות של הצעות של אה, דברים שיהיו כלולים בתוכנית העבודה, והצוות המוכשר של קרן רמון, צוות רקיע, הצליח להרכיב ולהעביר את כל הניסויים האלה לדרך כל המגבלות של נאס"א, של ספייס אקס ושל אקסיום בשביל שהם יתאימו לעבודה בתחנת החלל. אז אני נרגש לקחת איתי את כל הציפיות האלה של כל כך הרבה אנשים ו- ולבצע אותם ב- במהלך שבוע שלם בתחנת החלל. Thank you. Any, can you give us a synopsis of what you said? <laughs> that you're really excited to go to space. I got it. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, we have lots of questions. We will go next with Sophie Sanchez from Chicago News. This is for, for Peggy. The ISS crews have traditionally been carefully chosen from large pools of astronauts across all agencies to ensure crew compatibility. Without a core, um, how um, how do you pick from, and what has the experience has been in building um, this camaraderie, this team? Well, I think this crew has done a phenomenal job pulling together all the different aspects that are required. We, like NASA, have done a, a NOLS National Outdoor Leadership Training Session, specifically uh, focused on expeditionary type skills, basically uh, getting along with folks that you live and work with every day, all day. And uh, this crew, I think, had some challenges along that way in that mission, and that actually helped bond them together very strongly. And you can see that, obviously, even in these interviews, that there is a lot of camaraderie there uh, and an important part of the mission. Uh, I think another level uh, is actually the interaction between um, the Axiom crew and the ISS crew. And we've done a lot of work uh, in preparation for this mission to ensure we have the best compatibility and able to work with uh, the station crews and be a, become a part of their team as well uh, and become all together, playing together fun. Thank you, Peggy. 
next question, um, we will go with Michael Sofredini for Fox Weather. For the people who are unfamiliar with private admissions, can you explain why this is an important step and what you hope it will eventually evolve to? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, you know, when uh, when Dr. Cam Gaffarian and I started this company back in, uh, in what well, we formed it in January of 2016, our vision really was this opportunity to make space more accessible. And it, it had to do with the idea that uh, today there are individuals uh, and companies who want to try, and other countries that want to try to utilize a low earth orbit to do a number of things, many of which you've heard of here. This is a good, this is a good example. Uh, the, and they just couldn't. Uh, today, there are, there are countries and individuals and companies that don't have access to ISS, uh, largely because the 15 countries that own and operate it uh, fully utilize it. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful spacecraft, uh, of course, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's only got so much capacity and it's, it's fairly well utilized. Um, and so the whole idea of these missions was to, to give individuals, countries, uh, and companies offered other opportunities to be able to utilize ISS and ultimately uh, do more and more in space. And of course, the growth of the economy in low Earth orbit is very important to us. The utilization of microgravity has so many applications. You've heard them here, but but particularly in manufacturing, the microgravity environment is going to play a big role in 3D printing of organs, uh, fibers you've heard of, all kinds of uh, metal alloys that are so far superior to their cousins on the ground. All of these applications are, are opportunities and our job is to create the environment and give the access so that when people have a good idea, uh, they, have, they know they have a place to go and a way to, to implement it. And heretofore, that just hasn't been the case. So you think about the internet, when we all started thinking about the internet, we don't, well, that was really cool. I have access to all kinds of things in terms of documents. And of course it exploded with the, the number of use cases that are out there. That was possible because pretty much anybody with a little bit of programming skills and a good idea could go create an app and get it on the internet. And it, and it was a booming business. And we're trying to create that same environment because when you start thinking about the applications of microgravity and the role it can play in almost every industry, it is really way beyond what we can imagine today. And so the whole idea was to, to open up this whole world uh, to everyone to try to exploit and utilize in a way that ultimately would benefit uh, humanity. Thank you. Our next question comes from Marcia Smith, and this is for Mark. Similar, similar question to what was asked of Aton. What message do you have for Canadians about the importance of this mission for them in Canada? How is it different? How is it different? How different is your flight from those of the professional Canadian astronaut corps? Uh, obviously, a, a big difference is uh, in the funding, which is uh, obviously for this flight not coming from from the government, but coming uh, privately. Um, I think that uh, the message I hope Canadians get from this, uh, I hope to be successful in, in highlighting the value and importance and, uh, and, uh, and uh, sheer amount of Canadian research uh, that is available as going on um, and that, uh, that can be promoted. A lot of this, this research that I'm taking up, uh, which, is, which does come from Canadian universities and research institutions, uh, would not have otherwise probably had the opportunity to get tested in space. Um, so I'm happy to, to provide that opportunity. And I hope that uh, in the future, uh, other Canadian private astronauts will be able to collaborate with the government for even greater impact um, and, uh, and not just create research opportunities, but I think take advantage of the many economic opportunities uh, available for Canadians uh, in this new space economy. Thank you, Mark. Our next question comes from Manuel Mazanati from Debate Spanish Radio. I'm going to read it in English and Spanish. It'd be great. This is for MLA for Michael Lopez Alegria. It'd be great if you could explain how important are those commercial missions to help and improve 
the amount of research for future long duration space flights. Uh, Michael, sería muy bueno si nos pudiera explicar por qué estas misiones comerciales privadas son tan importantes para ayudar a mejorar y acelerar las investigaciones sobre el cuerpo humano para futuros vuelos. Pues en primer lugar, gracias por la pregunta. Eh, el presidente siguió Mike Safferdini empezó un poco a explicar que hoy en día el, la, los socios de la ISS, que son 15 países, controlan toda la investigación que pasa a bordo. Y si gente privada o instituciones que no tienen mucho vínculo con esas agencias o esos países, es bastante más difícil que puedan subir. Y nuestra idea es democratizar un poco ese proceso para dejar libre y más fácil el camino para instituciones ajenas a esos países o esas agencias espaciales para poder subir su, su investigación, su ciencia, y, por, y como eso podemos abrir um, las posibilidades a más gente. You want a translation now? <laughs> <laughs> It's basically referred to what Saf uh, alluded to, and that is that, you know, now um, the ISS, wonderful vehicle that it is, is sort of restricted to 15 uh, countries and the five agencies that are, are, represent them. And to some degree, the research institutions that are sort of plugged into them, um, there is a little bit of expansion through the ISS National Lab. But what we aim to do is democratize that process to make it a very level playing field so that um, research entities from all over without necessarily a certain pedigree can present those things on a clean sheet of paper and, and have better possibility of getting into the microgravity environment. Thank you so much. Our next question has come from Micah Maidenberg from the Wall Street Journal. This is to Michael Sopardini. Do you um, believe being able to conduct this mission and the others plans on the ISS gives Axiom Space any competitive advantage over other companies planning their own commercial space stations? If so, what are they? Well, let me first start by saying we're, we're excited to see so many companies interested in, in building platforms and helping grow the LEO economy. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, back in uh, 2019, NASA opened up a competitive procurement for all U.S. companies uh, to compete for the opportunity to attach to the International Space Station. Ultimately, uh, we were uh, competitively selected to, to have this opportunity. Uh, which included attaching our modules and building out our station uh, and ultimately then departing when ISS is ready to be retired. Um, and in addition to that, as part of our, our effort, we have had we've established these series of uh, flight opportunities, which we do have to compete for. They're not they're not given to us. So we, we have to uh, request from NASA for each of these opportunities that we fly because there's very limited opportunities to ISS. Um, and these flights do give us the opportunity to work together with NASA uh, and crews uh, to, to practice, if you will, uh, flying humans in space together with the international partners of the ISS. And that's very, very important because uh, after our first two modules are on, on orbit, we'll be able to house uh, eight crew, we'll have life support and quarters and and all the facilities necessary to support eight crew and, and do research. A third module actually brings on a, a, a research dedicated uh, module. And so it, you can imagine at that point would be very busy. And so it's important for us and, uh, and the space agency, uh, the space agency, excuse me, to be able to practice this at a sort of a smaller scale leading up to that point. Uh, so that's our business plan. We think it does put us, uh, it, it does uh, put us in a good place relative to the competition, but we're, we're happy that there are others that uh, are going to help us grow the Leo economy along the way. Thank you. Our next question is for Larry Connor from Katie Kaputz, sorry, Kaputza from Spectrum News One Ohio. What does it mean to you to pilot this historic mission? How do you see this mission changing the way people view getting to space in the future? Yeah, Katie, uh, thank you for the question, but I really don't think it's about me. I think it's about the team. You know, my role is to support everybody, specifically uh, the commander. And 
I think this is the first step in many steps to have both the private sector and the public sector work together to expand you know, opportunities, whether it's research, technology, growth, great careers, et cetera. And by the way, that's not just for Ohio, the Midwest of the United States. Uh, I think that's around the world. Thank you, Larry. Our next question will come from Gina Sinceri from ABC. Um, this question is for Peggy. You've eaten many meals on the space station and once threatened not to open the hatch when Pal Moroy docked if she didn't bring hot sauce. How important is the special meal going to space station for the crew that's been up there for months? Oh, I think that having a variety, something new is always of value for the space station crew who's been up there for a long duration period of time. And so I, I'm hopeful that this will help our, our crew bonding with, uh, with the ISS crew. But uh, I, I had the privilege of tasting the food, so I'm, I'm quite sure they're going to be pleased. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Our next question comes from Will Robinson, and it's directed to the crew. Question for Larry, Aton, and Mark specifically. How um, were you approached for this mission and why was it important for you to take part in this first mission? Go ahead, guys. Aton? Well, in my case, it was easy. I had a very good friend. Um, if it was a, an astronaut, a NASA astronaut, Garrett Reisman, and uh, we meet annually at the memorial and at the Space Week of, in Israel. And he called me a, a year and a half ago and just asked me, are you coming with me to space? I said, yes. And then on, I could not uh, uh, avoid this commitment anymore. <laughs> Mark? Uh, yeah, for me, uh, I actually reached out to Axiom after, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a friend of mine uh, brought my attention to, uh, to this mission. Um, and uh, after you know a year and a half of due diligence, uh, eventually signed signed the contract. Um, I have to say I struggled between whether to to sign up for the first mission or to wait for for a subsequent one. Um, and in the end, I thought, well, you know, someone's got to do this first. It might, <laughs> might as well be me. And I'm very glad that I made that decision. So first off, my friend, I'm happy you made that decision. <laughs> Second, uh, I was fortunate in my research, I found a fella inside of the space industry who called me one day and said, hey, there's a company called Axiom. I think you really ought to check them out. Uh, it's a team of true professionals. I think they're gonna be teaming with SpaceX, all which proved to be the case. And it was the best decision I believe I could have made. Thank you, gentlemen. Our next question is um, for Eitan. This question is from Jonathan Moraz from the Israeli Hayom. Um, it says, how will you feel celebrating Passover and having the cedar in space? Thank you for the question. Uh, it's a new thing. It's just uh, caused by the last delay. <laughs> So um, the Seder, Passover is all about freedom, which is a value which we celebrate annually and remind ourselves about the importance of freedom. Uh, this is based on a, a 3000 year old story um, where Moses had the famous sentence, let my people go, shlach <laughs> et and uh, we have several traditions in that uh, feast, including drinking at least four glasses of wine. So I took a wine glass with me, but I don't think I will find any wine in the station. And I don't think I need a glass to drink wine. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eitan. Um, our next question will come from, forgive me here. We have a few um, for we, we have a few more minutes before conclude. So if you want to submit a question, please do so in the chat. Um, and our next question is from Alex Diaz from Fox News. What do you hope this mission will contribute to the broader history and future of the ISS, particularly um, given 
everything that's going on in the world and international relations broadly. I don't know if, if, if Mike Safradini or Michael A wants to take that question. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so I get, I get a similar question asked of me uh, regularly and I'll, I need to start by saying uh, when I was the ISS program manager, which I was for about 10 years before I retired, um, it was very clear to me that the legacy of the International Space Station is really the partnership. Uh, although the spacecraft is a fantastic spacecraft and well-built and all of our crew have done a great job of, of utilizing her and taking care of her, it really is the partnership. And there's something about human spaceflight that kind of holds us all together. Uh, and, and you see that. You've seen it before. You see it today. In spite of everything going on, uh, we're still together as a partnership. It was, it was very well demonstrated with the return of the, the recent crew here a couple of days ago with Mark Vanda Hyde on a Soyuz vehicle. Um, so we're, we're still very tight. And for us, for my vision of, of our species, um, it's really about exploring beyond low Earth orbit. We really need to learn to live off our planet for, for a lot of reasons. There's this innate desire to, to explore that we all have. There's this uh, need to make sure that we can survive whatever happens, which means we need to learn to live off the planet. But we cannot do that as a handful of countries. We must do this as a species. And so when we start human spaceflight, and it's a unique opportunity to hold uh, countries together, our job is to grow the number of countries that are working together in low Earth orbit and not let, let them together explore beyond low Earth orbit. So we do do it as a species. And so that sounds pretty grandiose, I must admit. Um, we talk a lot about the applications and, and the utilization of microgravity environment, but really deep down, this is about uh, pulling us together uh, as, a, as 200 and whatever countries that we are today. It's about pulling us all together. And this, this human space flight is a unique opportunity to do that. So I'm thrilled that we have um, a, a crew that is uh, multinational. That's one of the coolest parts about this mission is that, um, and because it represents this step that's so important to, for us all to do, when you get to orbit, you see this big blue ball. You don't see borders. You don't see dogma. You see this wonderful blue ball that we all share together. And it really does drive us to try to, you know, figure out how to, to live peacefully together. So I see it differently. I see flying to space as a bunch of nations is what pulls us, help pulls us together uh, in spite of, of our differences on the ground. Thank you so much for that. Um... I have a question from Marcia Smith um, to the crew, specifically um, to Larry, Mark, and Aton. Apart from your family and friends, what kind of reaction do you get from non-space crowd when they learn that what you're doing? I will start with Aton. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm just That's going in order. <laughs> There's a huge excitement in Israel about uh, having a, the opportunity to hear Hebrew from space after 19 years, uh, to take part in this uh, incredible uh, international cooperation, the, the International Space Station, and uh, the whole country is looking forward to, to this mission. So I'm, uh, I'm there and I'm trying to perform as much as possible of the work plan, and uh, it will be a great uh, adventure. Larry? So the messages that I've received over the last few weeks, and especially the last few days, have had a few commonalities. They are amazing, good luck, and Godspeed. Fantastic. Mark? Uh, yeah, for me, it's been uh, a reaction overwhelming, overwhelmingly of uh, excitement, um, occasionally uh, envy. Um, but uh, generally of great support. And uh, well, of course, uh, you know, there are naysayers out there. Uh, the people that I've interacted with have been overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive, uh, very uh, happy in any way possible to, to live this experience vicariously through me and to be a part of it. And uh, I'm, I'm proud to, to share it. So uh, I'd say that uh, that's, that's been, that support has been really helpful for me. 
Great. Well, we're almost out of time. We'll be taking one or two more questions. So um, thank you so much. Um, so just going through here. So forgive me one second. So compared to your NASA experience, what new experiences and insight are you hoping to gain on this flight to share with future astronauts? That question comes to us from Sophie Sanchez from Chicago Now, and that is directed to Michael Lopez Alegria. Thanks, Sophie. You know, I, I mean, every astronaut truly lives the experience um, in, first of all, a very unique way, but I think in a very profound way. And what my experience has been lately, so I left NASA 10 years ago, the last time I flew was 15 years ago, and being away from NASA and sharing those experiences with new friends, new colleagues has given me an ever greater appreciation for just how special that was. So, you know, it's a bit of nostalgia. And then to be able to be able to experience it one more time, I am, all my receptors are as wide open as they can possibly be because I just want to soak it in. Uh, it, it feels like a true gift to be able to having the foresight of what it felt like before. And again, all that um, longing for those experiences again, where they almost feel like out of touch and, and surreal in a way to be able to go back. It's like waking up and then going back into a dream. So I just, I'm really looking forward to absorbing the entire experience. And I really want these guys, cause I'm a little worried that they're working too hard while they're up there. <laughs> I want to see the smile on their face when we get to orbit and, and I want them to come home feeling like they, they accomplished their checklist and their mission and their work plan, but most of all that they had a wonderful experience and I think it's a tough balance, a tough thread to needle to thread, but I'm confident we're on the right, the right track for that. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question from Robert Perlman of Collect Space. Um, he wants to know if any of you would be interested in sharing a personal item that you've packed um, for the flight and if you can share that um, with them. I, Eitan, I know you mentioned something earlier during this press conference of something you'll be taking. Um, do you wanna just remind the, the say that again of a personal item that you're taking with you up to space i'll mention a, a unique item which is the miniature of the world peace bell mm. this is a story of the japanese after the second world war donating to the united nations a peace bell it was created of coins or metals that were uh, not uh, reused recycled and the, the, it's a huge peace bell the, in the garden of the United Nations. And uh, since then they have made several copies of that uh, world peace bell and we installed one in Israel as well, in the city of Lod. And I will take a miniature of this peace bell as a mentioning or a signal of the International Space Station being a center for Peace, world peace. For me, Bettina, you know, we're, it's mostly uh, effects for personal friends and family, of course, but I'm also bringing uh, what's called an expedition flag from the Explorers Club. So these flags uh, are sent out on expeditions to the highest points on earth, to the lowest points at the bottom of the sea and every which way in between. And so it'll be a real pleasure for us to go back to uh, New York and deliver the flag having flown in space one time. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like I'm the only one who doesn't have any sort of cool historical <laughs> stuff with me. It's, uh, it's all uh, kind of personal stuff. Uh, uh, three of my kids' uh, favorite toys, uh, some, uh, some coins I brought to, to give to them when I get back, uh, a couple of gifts for my wife and my brother. Um, and a few other gifts um, for, for people, some, some patches or little flags that, uh, that friends gave to me to, to bring up on their behalf. So it's, it's pretty much all personal stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, if that's okay, we are running out of time. 
So I really appreciate all of our speakers and everyone that's participated today. And I just remind that we are ready to launch on April 6th. Launch is currently scheduled for 12.05 Eastern. We hope you can join us in the action. We'll be in the, the AX1 webcast at 8.40 a.m. on Wednesday. And we look forward to joining you on for, for you to all join us on this mission. Thank you and have a great day. Go AX1. Thank you all.